Hello and welcome back to Hilbert Spaces, the video series where we extend our functional analysis knowledge to inner product spaces. And in today's part 12, we will prove Bessel's inequality for orthonormal systems. In fact, this inequality will show us a connection to the orthogonal projection we have already discussed before. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, with the membership on Steady, you can download a lot of additional material for the videos. For example, you find books, quizzes and the downloads for the videos. And now before we formulate Bessel's inequality, let's first discuss an important connection we have in Hilbert spaces. Indeed, you already know, if we have a Hilbert space X and a closed subspace U, then the orthogonal projection onto the subspace U exists. And now let's say we have a finite O and S with E1, E2 until En. So this is an O and S in a Hilbert space and obviously it spans a finite dimensional closed subspace in X. So we can just write that U is defined by the span of these N vectors. And at this point you are surely familiar with the general picture, we just have our closed subspace here and we project vectors onto it. So for example here we could have our vector x and then we know that the orthogonal projection is unique and exists. And moreover the normal component for x is orthogonal to the subspace u. And now it turns out that this orthogonal projection can be just calculated by using our ONS. Namely, we can just project our vector x separately onto each direction in the O and S. And now you can remember a projection for the E1 direction always looks like E1 times the inner product where E1 is on the left. And on the right hand side we have our vector we want to project, so x. So this is how a one dimensional projection looks like and the crucial ingredient here is that E1 has length 1. And now since all these normalized vectors are mutually orthogonal, we can just sum up the one dimensional projections. Hence we just have a finite linear combination of these vectors. So in this case we go from k is equal to 1 to n. And please note, usually in a linear combination we would write scalar times vector, but we exchange this order here to remember this combination ek with ek. In other words, it's just a useful mnemonic device to remember this orthogonal projection in a Hilbert space. And in order to prove that this one is indeed the uniquely given orthogonal projection of x onto u, we just have to show that the normal component is perpendicular to u. And maybe to keep it simple here, let's call the normal component capital N. And by definition, this should be x minus the orthogonal projection. And indeed showing the orthogonality to u is enough because we know there is only one such decomposition of a vector x. Hence now we just have to calculate the inner product of n with an arbitrary vector from u. However such a vector can be written as a linear combination of our O and S. So we just have scalars lambda k times the vector ek. And now you see how this calculation works. We just put in our definition of n and use the linearity of the inner product. Indeed this happens very often when we deal with calculations in Hilbert spaces and orthonormal systems. So maybe here you see the first term x together with this vector here on the right. More concretely we can pull out the sum and the scalars and we just have x together with ek. And on the other hand we have minus and then we have this sum together with the other sum. So actually this is a double sum where we need two indices. So maybe let's say we have k and l. So let's say the second sum here has l as an index so we can pull out lambda l. And moreover the other scalar here on the left we can also pull out but you already know it has to get a complex conjugation. And lastly we put the vector ek together with the vector el. And exactly there as you might already guess the orthonormal system comes in. 
This means this one is actually the corner cut delta with index k and l, which makes the double sum collapse to one sum. So you see, the orthogonality here in the ONS makes everything simpler for us. So what remains here is a difference of two sums. And in fact, we immediately see that the two sums are exactly the same. The only thing we have to do here is to exchange the order in the inner product to get rid of this complex conjugation. And there we have it, we get out zero, and this shows that the normal component n is orthogonal to the subspace u. So this is the first thing to remember, for a finite O and S, the orthogonal projection of a vector x looks like this. So maybe again, as a reminder, if we look from the side, the picture always looks like this. And indeed what you see here is that the length of the orthogonal projection is smaller than the length of the original vector x. Or to say it more precisely, the norm of the orthogonal projection cannot be bigger than the original norm of x. And if you combine this fact with that formula here, then we get our Bessel's inequality. So you could say this is not a new result at all, but of course the power here lies in the generality. So what I mean with that is that Bessel's inequality holds in any inner product space and for any O and S in it. In particular, it means infinitely many vectors in the O and S are allowed. This capital I can be any index set. And now what Bessel's inequality tells us is that we can write a sum over this index set. And most importantly, then we sum over non-negative real numbers. And these are given by the absolute value of the inner product of E alpha with a vector x. So this x can be any vector in our inner product space x. And now if we square these, you might recognize something similar to the traditional Pythagorean theorem. So you could say it represents a length squared, and this one is smaller or equal than the norm of x squared. And moreover, this inequality holds for any vector in the inner product space. So in the case you have an orthogonal projection, you can remember that by taking the square root on both sides, and then it just says that the length of the orthogonal projection is smaller or equal than the original length. However, please note the existence of orthogonal projections was only guaranteed in Hilbert spaces. So Bessel's inequality is more general for any inner product space. So it's not needed to bring in orthogonal projections. We still get this nice inequality for an orthonormal system. So maybe the only problem you see in this general context is this infinite sum on the left hand side. In fact, I could be really large it could be an uncountable index set. Therefore, I really have to tell you the definition of such an uncountable sum. So this is a standard definition and not so complicated, but you don't see it so often. It's straightforward to define the sum for non-negative real numbers and let's call them d alpha. So again, we just take an index set i and this one can be uncountable. And now the sum here is not a big problem, because the entries are non-negative anyway, so the worst case would be that the whole thing is infinity. Therefore, we can just look at all possibilities to find finite subsums. So let's say we write down an index beta in a subset J. So here J is a finite set, so the sum over D beta definitely exists. So a well-defined sum, and we can do that for any finite subset J of I. And now of course you can ask, if we make j bigger and bigger, what happens to the value of this sum? In other words, in the end, we are just interested in the supremum of this set. So either it's a finite real number or infinity. So if you want, you can write this result as an interval from zero to infinity, where infinity is included. So roughly speaking, we get the maximal output we could reach with finite sums. And by using the supremum, we know it's always well defined. So in order to make it more concrete, let's look at an example. Let's simply say our index set is given by the real number line. And now we sum up the non-negative numbers given by the absolute value of x. And there we don't have to think much. Obviously, 
a finite subsum here can be as large as we want. In other words, the supremum here is definitely given by infinity. But still, the symbol here on the left has a meaning and we could calculate with it. Okay, and at this point you should note, even in Bessel's inequality, our index set i could be given by the real numbers. However, in contrast to here, Bessel's inequality tells us that infinity never comes out. Because the inequality here tells us that the supremum here is always a finite number. So there you see the strength of Bessel's inequality, this uncountable sum is actually not so bad. And now I would say, let's prove that. Which means we have to consider an arbitrary finite subset of our index set i. And then in the end of the calculation, we can go to the supremum. And maybe to keep it simple, let's say we have an enumeration of this finite subset. So the indices we have in are alpha 1, alpha 2 and so on. So if we do that, then you see this looks really similar to something we have done at the beginning of the video. Therefore, we could use the same construction as before, where we project separately onto each direction. So you could say, in the case we have the orthogonal projection, this would be it. And moreover, as we have shown before, if we look at x minus this orthogonal projection, then we get our normal component. And now this normal component has a length we can just measure with our induced norm. We can also square it and then we know this is definitely greater or equal than zero. So this is the starting point. This is how the inequality comes in. And now we just have to do the calculations with the inner product. So instead of the norm squared, we have the inner product with the same entry left and right. And then using the additivity in both components, we get four terms out. The first one is just x with itself. And then the next one is x with this sum. And obviously we have the same thing the other way around, which means this sum together with that x. And finally, the last term are two sums together, which means we have to introduce a new index again. So let's say the second index we have is given by L again. However, you might already recognize, as before, the double sum will collapse because of the property of the ONS. So maybe that's something we can do step by step. Let's pull out the sum sign and also the scalars. So this means here in the second term, we write the sum sign in the front and we can also pull out the scalar and we don't need a complex conjugation because we are in the second argument. And what remains inside the inner product is just x together with e alpha k. And now a similar thing we can do in the third term, but there you should see we need a complex conjugation if we pull out this scalar. Otherwise the whole thing is exactly the same as before. Indeed, we immediately recognize that these two terms are actually the same thing. However, let's first go to the last term where we have to pull out two sums and this scalar and that scalar. And there we already know the first one gets a complex conjugation. And the only thing that stays in the inner product is just this vector e alpha k and e alpha l. So there you see, this is exactly the point where our Kronecker delta comes in again. And in this case, we can simply write it as delta with index k and l. So we get that the double sum collapses again and everything is nice. So let's put it together. The first term here is just the norm of x squared. Then we subtract two times the same term. Namely, we can write it as the sum of the product of two inner products where we have e alpha k in the middle. And then we have plus and we see the last term is actually exactly the same sum. Indeed, we just have to exchange these two entries to get rid of the complex conjugation. Therefore, we have minus two plus one, so only minus one sum remains here. And of course, we could write it like we did it here, or we use the complex conjugation to write it as an absolute valued squared. And then you see, this is actually what we wanted to have from the beginning. So the claim is that this difference here is equal or greater than zero, 
So if we bring that sum to the left hand side, we have Bessel's inequality. So I would say, let's write it down. We have this sum is less or equal than the norm of x squared. And there please note, this inequality holds for any vector x in x, but also for any finite subset j. Therefore, we can go to the supremum and still get the same inequality. So we can write supremum over all finite index sets j as a subset of i. And then we just have a finite sum over the indices beta and we are done. So the finite sum is less than the norm squared and therefore also the supremum. Indeed, the supremum cannot change the less or equal sign here. So this is it. This is the proof of Bessel's inequality as a calculation with inner products. However, I already gave you the idea that this one is related to calculating the length of a vector with respect to a given O and S. Of course, the best thing would be to have an equality in Bessel's inequality. However, this is not possible in general for an O and S. However, we expect that an O and B, the best O and S, can actually do it. So this is something we can discuss in the next videos. So I really hope I meet you there and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you.